We're delighted to have with us tonight Walter Olson, who is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies and previously served as a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He has been a columnist for Great Britain's Times Online, as well as Reason, and his writing appears regularly in such publications as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, New York Post, the list goes on. He's a regular guest on major networks, including CNN, Fox News, PBS, NPR, and even Oprah. <laughs> Olson is the author of numerous books, the most recent of which is Schools for Misrule, Legal Academia, and an Overlawyer America by Encounter Books. Also joining us tonight is Michael Ferris, founding president of Patrick Henry College. He serves as chancellor of the college and chairman of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, of which he is also founding president. As a constitutional appellate litigator, Dr. Ferris has served as lead counsel in the United States Supreme Court, eight federal circuit courts, and the appellate courts of 13 states. At Patrick Henry College, Dr. Ferris teaches constitutional law, public international law, and coaches PhD's moot court team, which has won eight national championships. He's a prolific author and has been recognized with a number of awards, including the Salvatore Prize for American Citizenship by the Heritage Foundation and as one of the top 100 faces in education for the 20th century by Education Week Magic Magazine. Please welcome for his opening remarks in the affirmative, Dr. Ferris. Thank you so much. It's good to be with you here in Missouri. Um, I'm originally from Stone County, Arkansas. I uh, had a case in Calico Rock, Arkansas, which is not that far below the south of the Missouri border several years ago when my primary office was still in Washington, D.C. And I called a lawyer in Mountain View, Arkansas to be local counsel for me. And uh, I said to her, you know, I'm a lawyer from Washington, D.C., but I want you to know I'm originally from Timbo, Arkansas. And she said, Lord of mercy, I didn't know anybody from Timbo could find Washington, D.C. <laughs> but I like the lawyer there. So uh, all those uh, things that you just heard about, you need to really know that I'm actually from Timbo. So uh, the uh, place I'm going to start tonight is with a couple of political maxims that were true of the founding generation in this country. First is the founders believed that structure, good structure, was essential to the preservation of liberty. So we have checks and balances, division of power, and especially federalism. The right decision-making structure leads to good policy and is protective of freedom. The second political maxim is that no branch of government should be the final judge of how much, branch, how much power that branch has, whether it's Congress or the Supreme Court or the White House and the executive branch or the federal government collectively. No branch of government should be the final judge of how much power that branch of government has. A, a, a branch of government that is the final judge of its own power is a branch that will ultimately turn to tyranny because it can. That's, those are the premises that I believe will lead us to the conclusion that it's now time to use Article 5 in the Constitution to give us the founder's solution to a runaway tyrant of the federal government that we all live under. Now, people will say, why are we trying to change the Constitution? After all, they don't live under the Constitution now. How will it make any difference? And my answer to them is, we actually, if you ask the federal government, are you living under the Constitution? They'll say yes. And they'll be right with a big asterisk. There are two constitutions in this country. There's a little plan pamphlet you can get for about a dollar, lots of different places. That's the original Constitution. It's the same, the original, original is under glass at National Archives. But little booklets can contain the original Constitution. Or you can go to the government printing office and buy a book called The Constitution of the United States. That's its entire title. The book is 2,300 pages long. And by the way, the last four or 500 pages in the book are blank. They plan to add to their 2,300 pages. They're, those are the two constitutions. We have the Constitution as written, and we have the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court. 
So when the federal government claims that it's following the Constitution, what they're doing is they're following the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court, which rarely is the same as the Constitution as written. That is the problem. The solution to our problem is what can we do to return our government in the direction of the Constitution as written and away from the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court. That's the problem that we're trying to solve here in, in the debate before us today. Now, all of us who have been involved in the conservative movement for any length of time, and I've been essentially full-time in this movement for 40 years. I was seven at the time. I actually had my Bean's birthday this year. I, you know, will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? So. so I've been at this since I was 24 years old, full-time. And in that time, the conservative movement has focused primarily on two things, good policy and electing good people. And those are good things to do. We should be working for good policy, and we should be working for good people in every possible election. But we have found over time, especially as we focus on the federal government, that whatever we have done in good policy and good people isn't working, because the colossal aggrandizement of power that's going on in Washington, D.C. is on a steady march in one direction, and that is centralization, 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 all headed in the wrong direction, no matter what we've done in the conservative movement for at least the 40 years I've been involved. And so policy and people alone have not been a solution. What we have neglected to do is work on the structure of government, the very thing the founders thought was the most important thing that we could be doing is preserving the structure of limited government. Now I'm going to give you three quick examples of a problem between the, cons the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court compared to the Constitution as written. We'll start with the General Welfare Clause. The General Welfare Clause was taken from the Articles of Confederation, which should tell you all you need to know about its meaning. Anybody that thinks the current definition of, or meaning of the General Welfare Clause according to the Supreme Court, which is this, Congress can tax and spend for any fool thing it wants. If they thought that was the meaning of the General Welfare, uh, in, of the General Welfare Clause in the Articles of Confederation, you need some history lessons. The Congress in the Articles of Confederation had no such power, and Madison in the Federalist Papers said, if you want to know the meaning of the General Welfare Clause, the first thing you need to know about it is it came from the Articles of Confederation. But the Constitution, as written, Madison said the General Welfare Clause was not a grant of power, but rather it was a limitation of power. When Congress uses its enumerated powers to tax and spend for postal roads or the military or for the patent office, it's got to do so in a way that's for the general welfare, meaning the whole country, not some earmarked local project, nor are you making special deals for your buddies. That's what the general welfare clause meant. It was a limitation on power. Hamilton took a different view, that it was a grant of power, in a, above and beyond the enumerated powers, and I'm going to wrap back to what Hamilton really meant in just a second, because I need to tell you what the Supreme Court did. In a case called Butler versus the United States in the 1930s, the Supreme Court said that there, for, in about a paragraph and a half, it's about a half a page of text, they made a decision that they said, well, Madison said this, and Hamilton said this, and Joseph Story also supported Hamilton, and we're just really too busy to explain this to you, but we're going to go with Hamilton. That's about what it says. It is not a full explanation by any stretch of the imagination. And that interpretation is the headwater of our entire national debt. But for that paragraph, we would not be officially $19 trillion in debt. If you take actual uh, business accounting version of our debt, Tom Coburn says it's at least another $143 trillion. And so the, the full debt is much more than 19 trillion. But the entire debt is attributable to that paragraph and a half. Now, the court embellished on that, but when you go to the Obamacare decision, for example, that case, Butler versus the United States, is cited as the fountainhead of the decision that the General Welfare Clause imposes no constitutional subject matter limitations on the power of Congress to spend. Do you want to live in a country where Congress has no subject matter limitations on the powers of men. We can battle this policy and that policy until we're blue, blue in the face. As long as we have a central government that has no subject matter limitation on its power to spend, we will never be a free people. 
Second example, the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause meant that Congress could regulate shipping. That's it. Not economic activity, shipping. Banking is not commerce. Agriculture is not commerce. Mining is not commerce. Manufacturing is not commerce. Shipping is commerce. How do we know? 100% of the power to regulate interstate commerce is given to the federal government, to Congress. If states can regulate something, it's not interstate commerce. States regulate banking. The reason your ATM card works in a machine anywhere is not because of any federal law, it's because the Uniform Commercial Code passed by the states. The states said, well, we could all work together, so they work together and they passed the Uniform Commercial Code. State law, states can regulate banking, therefore banking is not interstate commerce. It is definitionally true if you look at the original jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of the United States. It is shipping and only shipping. And yet, the wages and hours of babysitters and all manner of oppressive regulations are trying to kill the coal industry through the, the, the Commerce Clause and many, many other problems in our country is from the false interpretation of the Commerce Clause. Finally, the Supreme Court 20 times has said there is no check on our power other than our own internal sense of self restraint. 20 times. That's an admission that they are violating in violation, structurally in violation of one of the founding maxims of this country. They are the determiners of how much power they should have. And ladies and gentlemen, that cannot stand unless we want to live in a tyrannical country. And I submit to you this very self-evident truth. Washington, D.C. will never change. I don't care how many think tanks we have in Washington, D.C. I don't care how many people like me you have hanging around the edges of Washington, D.C. I'm smart enough to live 50 miles away in a dirt road looking at the Blue Ridge Mountains. But you don't, it doesn't matter who you send to Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. will influence the conservatives more than the conservatives influence Washington, D.C. And the reason that's true is you cannot repeal the sin nature of man. I don't care who you elect, the sin nature of man says, I want power for myself. And Washington, D.C., the number one rule of Washington, D.C. is we want power for Washington, D.C. The founder's solution is a convention of the states. Matt Mason said, George Mason at the Constitutional Convention said, this government will surely abuse its power. And when that day comes, we need to have the states to be able to have authority to make structural changes to the Constitution to stop the abuse of power by the federal government. There's three stages, uh, 36, or excuse me, 34, 26, 38 of the stages. That's the number of states you need to vote for each stage. 34 to call the convention, 26 states to um, approve the text at a convention, and then 38 states to ratify. My opponent is going to tell you that this is dangerous and it will run away. My question to him is, give me your solution to a runaway federal government. I want to hear your solution. Not just me saying my solution. I want to hear your solution. Thank you very much. I'm always warned when I go to one of these debates that I must not agree too much with the opposite party because that's not entertaining when the two parties agree. <laughs> um, but I find it hard to restrain myself because so much of what Dr. Ferris has said I am in enthusiastic agreement with. Um, you knew I would because I'm from the Cato Institute um, uh, and because I'm with their Center for Constitutional Studies. You knew I would be appalled at the way that the federal government has slipped its intended bounds and has uh, taken through things like the General Welfare and Interstate Commerce Clauses, many powers never intended for it to have by the uh, founders. You knew that I would be uh, very much on Dr. Ferris's page as far as the structural importance of the Constitution. Uh, Nino Scalia used to say that uh, the Bill of Rights was an afterthought. It was perhaps the most important afterthought the government ever had, and yet the real protection for our rights against tyranny was to be found in the structural aspects of the Constitution that came earlier. And I completely agree with that. This was the same <coughs> Anthony and Scalia who followed a fascinating trajectory, however, on this issue. And here, I'm afraid I'm going to be getting into some disagreement. Uh, on this idea of whether or not the uh, irresponsibility of the federal government, its, its own runaway quality, is best remedied by having an Article 5 Constitutional Convention under the mechanism provided there. In 1979, he took part in a, a round table at AAI. I uh, joined AAI the year after that, uh, in which he was quite enthusiastic about the idea. 
Uh, over the course of the years, he changed his mind. And in the last year of his life, he responds to a question in a speech, I believe. He called it a horrible idea, but I certainly would not want a constitutional convention. Whoa, who knows what would come of that, unquote. So he traversed 180 degrees on this. And Justice Scalia, like me, liked a lot of the ideas for individual constitutional amendments that people have chosen. And they run the gamut, and not just among different types of conservatism, but also they run the complete ideological gamut. Because one of the constitutional uh, convention proposals out there is coming from the left and would overturn Citizens United and strip businesses of rights in various ways. It has already been approved by four states, California, Vermont, uh, New Jersey, and Illinois. Most of them are coming generally from the conservative side. Best known the balanced budget amendment, of course, which has been part of the debate for decades and decades now. But what has been fascinating in recent years is the diversification of ideas for an Article 5 convention. I'll, I'll read Article 5 in, in a minute, but I want to just sketch out a bit about the politics, because the balanced budget people uh, were insistent, uh, don't worry about a runaway convention that would somehow or other uh, tinker with the First Amendment or would tinker with treaties or, or uh, federalism, we are here to uh, specifically reform the fiscal responsibility of the government. And they stay on that track. A few years ago, Mark Levin, the uh, famous uh, talk show host, came out with a book called The Liberty Amendments, which said, no, uh, you're, <clears throat> it's not enough to just do one uh, area important as the budget may be. Uh, and he put forward six or eight different ones. Uh, Senator Marco Rubio recently I did, uh, uh, endorsed the idea of a multi-sweep uh, set of amendments, including term limits. And then Governor Greg Abbott of Texas, and this was only a few weeks ago, uh, proposed in an area that fascinating 80 or 90 page uh, article, he said that there should be a constitutional amendment in which all ideas were on the table. And the ones he offered in nine plans were a Texas plan. Um, nearly all of them would resource power to the state governments from that has currently been taken by the federal government. I agree. Good objective. I like many of the specifics in Abbott's plan. But what was fascinating was how frank he was. He showed up the Texas plan and he said, bring them in. Uh, I'm paraphrasing what he said. Let's have a New Jersey plan in which they want to roll back the Second Amendment uh, to allow for more gun control than the Supreme Court has allowed them. You, by the way, this anticipates why the National Rifle Association is dead set against the Article 5 Convention because they see this coming. Uh, there would be a California plan, and if you aren't quivering as a conservative or libertarian at the very idea of a California plan to re reform the Constitution, uh, it would give the government probably a lot more power than it currently has. There would be a national security plan from some state uh, that is particularly worried about terrorism, which would uh, ease the Fourth Amendment cons uh, controls on surveillance and search and seizure, perhaps ease some of the First Amendment controls on speech against the government. So there would be all of these different plans, and we would then find a negotiation. <coughs> Perhaps they would agree to uh, take up an idea from here and an idea from there. But they would be big ideas, because when people think of <coughs> constitutional, everyone with a big idea, and that very much includes the left, would be on the road to Philadelphia or wherever this would be. Now, I am not reassured, and I'm not reassured specifically because I'm a textualist and I'm an original meaning, a public meaning uh, follower. Um, let me read you, it's not that long, the full relevant text of the of Article 5. I'm skipping a bit, but it's historically relevant. The Congress, whenever two thirds of both the houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, that's the regular plan, or on the application of the legislatures of of two-thirds of the several states shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution, when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states. Two-thirds to propose, three-fourths to, to ratify, exactly as I was saying, or by conventions in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification be proposed by the Congress. And no more explanation, no more specifics than that. Now, it is the procedural rocks on which this is likely is to sink. 
we know that Congress is keeping a list of applications for conventions. Uh, this is an announcement that uh, was brought in, I believe, by Congressman Goodwin a few years ago. So at least they're keeping a list. At some point, and the balanced budget calls are getting pretty close to the requisite number, at some point, someone in Congress is going to have a decision to give them a whole lot of power, which is, has the threshold been reached? And some of the questions that they've got to address then are, what if there is similar but not identical wording? Uh, do they interpret it unsympathetically, saying, no, you crossed the T here and you did not cross the T uh, in Montana. We're not going to kind of just the same call. Uh, go back and do it right, taking another who knows how many years. Or are they going to be liberal about it and say, look, there was a resolution here uh, in 1969 that called for fiscal responsibility. There is another one just passed this year that called for a balanced budget. Clearly, they meant the same thing. Because notice that what's going on is not only uncertainty as to whether or not the topics are close enough to each other and the wording is close enough to each other, but also as to whether or not the timing is close enough to each other. Contemporaneity, one of my few words, chances to get to use that word. Um, Logically, if you understand the meeting of the minds, as it were, that's supposed to be going on between the states, it's supposed to be, as with a contract, a meeting of the minds at the same time. If they call for a convention 30 years apart, and some of the calls are very older than that, uh, does it count as contemporaneous if in the state that called back in the 1960s, the complete political connection, the complexion of the state has changed in the meantime? Um, what if they have, as several states have done, what if they have passed a rescission uh, uh, resolution saying we take back our call. Now it turns out that there's a whole legal literature on rescission and contemporaneity, much of it inherited from the debate over the Equal Rights Amendment back in the 1970s, in which uh, they almost got it, led, I believe, by a St. Louis uh, uh, public figure, Phyllis Schlafly. The states were convinced, hold on, not necessarily such a good idea, it stopped just short. Congress then tried to extend the ratification period, doing violence to the idea that they had to be simultaneous ones. A bunch of states attempted to rescind, and liberals and feminists went to Congress saying, do not allow rescissions. It's like a roach motel. They can check in, but they can't check out. Um, you, know, it's, you lose the logic of actually having the states all be deciding something at the same time uh, if you don't allow rescissions. Uh, and yet, it's uncertain whether or not they have to. So, Someone has to decide these questions. Okay, I think one, one minute or so. Okay. Um, someone has to decide these questions. It is easy to drift into a constitutional crisis if they are not decided the same way by everyone. Now, um, I believe that Congress cannot uh, reasonably decide most of these questions in part because it is the target that whose power we are trying to limit. I believe they will eventually be decided by the Supreme Court. And what I would warn about is that that will happen at the very end of the process, probably, because they're not supposed to give advisory rulings. Years and years and years and years will be spent attempting to get uh, these things not only adopted, but then ratified. And finally, the Supreme Court will find something that wasn't done right, and will all end up in the end. We'll now hear a five-minute rebuttal from each speaker. I have a different view of Justice Scalia's um, so-called change. And that view is driven by the fact that I've read the whole quote, not the half a quote that he read you from Justice Scalia a couple years ago. So I'm going to read you the whole quote. I would certainly not want a constitutional convention. I mean, whoa, who knows what would come of that? But if there were a targeted amendment that were adopted by the states, I think the only provision I would amend is the amendment pr provision. I figured out at one time what percentage of the populace could prevent an amendment to the Constitution. And if you take a bare majority in the smallest states by population, I think something less than 2% of the people can prevent a constitutional amendment. That ought to be hard, but it shouldn't be that hard. Justice Scalia didn't change his view. He knows the difference between a constitutional convention and an Article V convention in the states. They are different animals. A constitutional convention is where you start from scratch outside the framework of the existing government, and he didn't want that. He made that very clear in his AEI presentation as a full-blown presentation. The, the poll quote that you got selectively by my opponent was at a, a, a seminar on the First Amendment with, uh, where somebody just asked a random question out of the audience. 
when there was full discussion. I don't think Justice Scalia changed his mind. I don't think he went senile. And I certainly don't believe that he forgot the difference between a constitutional convention and an Article 5 convention of the state. And his answer, his full, complete answer that was not read to you, continues to recognize that distinction. I'm on the board of the, the Education Committee of the NRA, and it's just not true. The NRA does not take a position one way or the other. I've dealt with this at the top levels of the NRA. It's a canard. It is simply not true. Okay. Now, as far as being a textualist and originalist, so am I. I, I, I agree with the same standard. But how do we know that jury have to be unanimous in criminal cases? It's not in the due process clause of either the 5th or the 14th Amendment. But that's a constitutional requirement. Nobody would dispute it. It is a procedural question that is found deeply embedded in the original literature. You can find it with no historical debate about that. And if you read the same historical literature, which I have done, I have read the 27 volume series. It's about 27,000 pages of material called the Documentary History of the Ratification of the Constitution. Now, I used a computer and I skipped around using word searches and so on. But I spent six months reading the documentary history of the ratification of the Constitution. And I can prove to you from originalist sources that the following things. It is one state, one vote. That is in volume two, the ratification debates in Massachusetts, when it says seven states assembled in convention as proposed can agree to amendments. Seven states at the time, first of all, you vote by state, and second, a bare majority was seven at the time. They clearly said one state, one vote, majority rules at a convention. In uh, the Pennsylvania Convention, it says that the proposed federal convention cannot be very dangerous while the legislatures of the different states possess the power of calling a convention, appointing the delegates, and instructing them in the articles they wish to be altered or abolished. The states control the process. Congress does not control the process. Congress does get to uh, uh, decide the aggregation issue that my opponent was talking about. And that's why I'm not working on the ballots budget amendment because they've been written all over the map over the last 40 years. That's why I'm working on the Convention of States project. Our application, which has been identical in every state that's voted on it so far, says this. The purpose of the convention is to impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and impose term limits on federal officials. They've been absolutely identical. There's no aggregation going to be an issue. There's no going to be lawsuits over ours. There will be on the BBA. Now, I think what the outcome will be is whatever Congress says. On that question, I think they'll hold it to be a political question, and whatever Congress says on BB aggregation will prevail in court. However, on ours, if Congress tries to mess with us, when we've been identical, we will win that litigation. Now, um, okay. half, a minute. half a minute. It's interesting you brought up the, the rescission of the ERA case. I litigated that case. I was the attorney that filed the first challenge to that in, in the late 1970s. I was literally two years out of law school. I went to the National Archives and I held in my hand the original ratification documents of every state from the 13th Amendment forward to modern times to see if they were contemporaneous and to see if they were identical in context. I have spent a lifetime litigating, working, researching, teaching on these issues. And I can tell you, it is, we know the process. It's one state, one vote, we can control the process. It is perfectly safe. And the fear arises when people read you half a quote from Justice Scalia. That is not a reasonable basis for fear. Do scholarship and you'll learn the truth. The truth is the founders gave us this solution to save the republic from a runaway federal government and he proposed not a hint of an alternative solution. Thank you. It, it happened that I spent last night rereading the 1979 uh, Scalia Roundtable at AAI. Um, it was the year after that that uh, Nino hired me to work for him uh, at AAI. And uh, Walter Burns, uh, Paul Bator, and Gerald Gunther were the other uh, uh, panelists. And in fact, despite all of the uh, stuff you've just heard about uh, how I'm somehow misrepresenting Justice Scalia, um, in fact, his views did change because the 1979 Justice Scalia was actually gung-ho, he was remarkably radical about 
um, not limiting the subject matter, uh, letting it venture out to Eric. He wanted uh, the abortion decision overturned, for example. He had a bunch of other ones that he wanted. He did not want to limit the subject matter. By last year, he, like most of the uh, consensus, had decided that uh, a much better bet was to try to do ones that were carefully limited, uh, both in subject matter and in specifying procedure. Now, the, um, and he explained, in fact, uh, that, uh, and I think this is one of the things that differed between 1979 and 2015, he said, we live in a bad century for constitution writing. He had seen a bunch of American law professors get sent out to Eastern Europe and elsewhere as constitution writing experts. He knew uh, the kinds of people who would wind up uh, be getting a call from Governor Cuomo in New York uh, if, if there were prospects of realizing the American Constitution. And he didn't want them anywhere near the protections of the current system. Now, the, <clears throat> and we've gotten back to an original intent of Nino himself, which is not the, 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 the way it's, it's supposed to be. But let me close, if only because I've run out of other material, with something constructive and forward-looking because uh, I've now been twice accused. I never do understand this accusation because if I see that someone is walking off a cliff, I don't have to propose you know, a visit to IHOP instead uh, as an alternative destination. But, the, but, but in fact, there's something better than either the jump off the cliff or the visit to IHOP because uh, Cato put out a policy analysis a few years ago by Michael Rappaport, who is one of the scholars who has um, investigated the Article 5 uh, <coughs> Uh, pr process at considerable length. And Rappaport has, to me, a simple and a brilliant idea, which is first, get the procedures straight and clear enough so that you're uh, certain how it would work and you uh, resolve the issues that we've been talking about le le as left unresolved. I could argue, by the way, about whether or not the adoption uh, can be completely independent of the population of the states. I predict that that's one of the grounds the Supreme Court would be urged to strike down amendments on if they did not give California and Texas a larger vote. Um, that is the structure of the other parts of the Constitution that small states can protect themselves, but they cannot make all the decisions by themselves. Leave that aside. Uh, the Rappaport scheme is simply uh, put your energy first into a roadmap for how to use conventions to um, change it. Um, come up with a, a consensus on how the convention process should work um, make it a huge political priority to get that one amendment adopted. And after that, the constitutional crisis that Mr. Olson has so alarmingly warned about won't happen. Thank you. Mr. Olson, I would suggest that you should have read the AEI debate more carefully. You said that Justice Scalia advocated an open convention. I'm reading to you from page 22 of that uh, I have not proposed an open convention. Nobody in his right minds would propose it in preference to a convention limited to those provisions he wants changed. You've just flatly misrepresented what he said at AEI, and it's wrong. Maybe that's what you, you know, but if you just skimmed this once, fine, maybe you missed it. And, and the fact that you work for him, I mean, if, you if he told you something in confidence, I can't debate that. All I can go on is the public record. And the public record, you have, mis you have twice misrepresented the public record by pulling a pull quote from a couple of years ago and by saying the opposite of what he said at the AEI Institute. You're just simply wrong. And I think it's just simply, you know, reading late at night and all of that, you probably just missed it. I don't think you would intentionally do that. Now, the, the point is that we have, the, the reason we got into this mess of the runaway convention idea is because leftists have been promoting this idea since the 1970s. Phyllis Schlafly was schnookered into following this by Justice Berger, Chief Justice Berger, when he was the, the head of the Constitution's uh, bicentennial. He made a speech to federal judges saying that the Constitution was illegally adopted. He doesn't believe in the integrity of his own document. And leftists like Berger, why did he say that? Why did he get Phyllis to start repealing them? Because at that moment, 19 states had an application for a convention to reverse Roe versus Wade. 19. Uh, Berger was the co-author of Roe versus Wade. He was the chief justice that sat over the killing of millions of babies. And so he wanted to cur uh, curtail the ability to reverse his landmark decision. That's why he did that. 
And it is just simply not true that the Constitution was a result of a runaway convention. I've just finished a 106-page law review article. Uh, no, it's 14-point type. When I shrink it to 12 point, it's 78 pages or something. Because I'm, I'm older and I, I need that big type. It is just not true that the Constitution was a result of a runaway convention. The states called the convention, the states told their delegates, and I quote, to render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of the union. There's an interesting little side note about uh, Massachusetts and New York delegates, but since New York never voted for the constitution one way or the other, they don't count. We have, a, we have a debate about whether the Massachusetts delegation obeyed their instructions, and the Massachusetts ratification convention voted 90-something to 50-something, which is the way they recorded the vote at the, at the convention against the notion that the delegates had violated their instructions. So the historical evidence is the contemporary judgment was they did not violate their instructions, even in a state like Massachusetts. We can trust our Constitution, we can trust this process, and if you study this in detail and actually immerse yourself in this material and don't just pull half quotes and skim over articles, you will know how safe this process really is. Well, we, we can agree at least that you should go look up the 1979 symposium on the web. Uh, it was an informal discussion. Uh, Nino's comments, like that of some of the others, wandered around, and it wasn't entirely clear what, uh, they were, uh, whether they were avoiding contradiction. But uh, you will find much more edification there than you will uh, from me or perhaps any of us. Um, well, if I get the floor back, uh, I'm happy to take the... Uh, Here's the reason that you can know that this is safe. Number one, the, you, you've, I've, I've given you the basics of why the Constitution was not illegally adopted in the first place. If, if you want to, you know, my, my law review article will be out soon, but there's a short version of that on our Convention of the States website that you can read right now. The, the second is that there is legal protection. The case I litigated, he talked about it, I litigated the ERA case. It, the, the ruling, there were two issues. Rescission was one of the issues, and the judge held, yes, the states can rescind their, their prior ratifications. And then secondly, the issue was whether or not Congress could change the rules in the middle of the street. One of the bases that people contend that Congress has the authority to do this is because they say, well, the Necessary and Proper Clause gives Congress the power to do whatever they want to do. Well, the reality is, in 1798, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that Congress has no power under Article I, which is where you find the necessary and proper clause, to affect Article V issues. It exclusively must use the Article V power itself. And the power that Congress tried to use in the ERA was held to be unconstitutional. Net ruling, you can't change the rules in the middle of the street. If you call a convention to limit the federal government, to impose fiscal restraints, and to impose term limits, you can't change the rules in the middle of the street. I litigated it, I won. About the other issue, about ratification, I believe I can litigate it and win this one as well. And so the, the final thing is this, and, and Mr. Olson puts this in his article that was published by Cato. 38 states have to ratify whatever's done. If 13 states vote no, it's no. If a single house in 13 states vote no, it's no. You know, let's assume all the other protections that we have just evaporate. We still have to get 13 states, single house, to vote no. And the idea that we can't get 13 states to vote no to stop something crazy is just politically naive in the extreme. Um, perhaps the, the difference is I built a college from scratch. I started a, a legal movement to, that protected homeschooling. When I started that, it was illegal in every place in the country. And I find it curious that a libertarian would tell me how I should use my time in politics. I think this is doable. If he doesn't want to join, fine, don't get involved. But he shouldn't come to me and tell me that it's not worth my time doing uh, the thing that the Founding Fathers gave us to do, the very process the Founders gave us. It's my judgment, and it's the judgment of other people like-minded. We get to decide, not the Cato Institute, not Mr. Olson, how we should use our time. If you don't want to participate, fine. Don't lecture the rest of us that it's a waste of our time. We think otherwise. I've built institutions from scratch. I believe we can save this country. I'm not a naysayer by profession. I'm a builder by profession. And I want to rebuild the original constitution of this country. Final word. 
Well, if, if you like, I, I find it curiously personal to uh, address remarks at undecided people and, and have it be imagined that I'm trying to um, uh, 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 say that, that uh, you know, no one should work on the issue at all. I, um, and I do admire uh, what Dr. Ferris has done on public school, and so uh, perhaps I should uh, stop with a point of agreement, um, because you must have some questions out there. We do have questions. The text of the Constitution is the first place to start. You cannot, for example, even if you, even if you called a convention that was open, if the call said, propose such amendments as you wish, it would not allow you to change the equality of the states in the US Senate. That is prohibited by the text of Article 5. Um, but it depends on the call of the convention. We, there have been 400 applications for a convention in the history of the country. We've never had one because there's never been two-thirds of the states agree on the subject matter. So we have a lock-solid precedent, 220-plus years precedent, that you have to agree on the subject matter to start. So the question is, can you change the subject matter once you start? Well, the, the history is you can't. I mean, the, the reason people say you can is they falsely accuse the Constitutional Convention itself of changing the subject matter. It's not true. It's just not true. Secondly, the case I litigated tells you the answer. You can't change the rules in the middle of the stream. It's unconstitutional to do so. And third, the backup is 38 states have to ratify. The idea that something crazy can get through that process, can get through the litigation, can get through the convention, is and it, with a one state, one vote thing, which is clearly part of the originalist understanding of the meaning of this text. It, it, you know, California can come all they want, they get one vote. Delaware gets one vote. Idaho gets one vote. They all get one vote. So the, the structure, the law, and the history is all on the side. The convention would be limited to the subject matter that it was called for. Um, you've asked a very good question, and a question that has preoccupied um, most, I think, of the scholars who have been writing about this for the last 50 years and more, um, they have not been as confident uh, in reaching a single conclusion as my worthy opponent. Uh, many of them have believed that um, uh, attempts to run away can be expected given human nature uh, and uh, are not well guarded against by the actual literal text of, the, uh, of Article 5 or the Constitution in, in which uh, it is embedded. Now, because of that fear, elaborate attempts have been made to um, constrain the attendees at such a convention. For example, um, not only have many states passing uh, calls for conventions uh, put in extensive language, um, which would not be they would not have needed to put in if not for fear of exactly this kind of runaway. But some of them have even gone so far as to attempt to criminalize being the delicate equivalent of a faithless elector. If you remember the Electoral College, um, people show up, they're expected to vote for the candidate uh, associated with their, their party that they want, and every so often here and there, someone decides on a whim or, or disillusion with that candidate uh, to cast a vote for someone else. And people are, uh, you know, they, they chuckle, but uh, that person never goes to jail. I, I predict that attempts to uh, constrain the delegates would be like velvet ropes at a restaurant. Uh, they will constrain the polite ones, at least for a while. Uh, they will not constrain the people who come there uh, with somewhat rowdier intent. They are just velvet ropes. Uh, they have no binding force. Uh, I would say, um, I, I, I would agree entirely with uh, Dr. Ferris that uh, the fact that these need to be ratified in the end by uh, all but 13 states uh, is a very important reason why um, you know, uh, the alarmism can get carried away. The, the founders knew perfectly well that the nation would occasionally be see, seized by a mob impulse. Uh, it would be led by demagogues to do something foolish, but they also knew that if they had a successful country, and I believe they founded a successful country, it would not usually be the case. So uh, the odds are very good that the ratification process would be during a period in which America was not so badly affected by demagogues and mob sentiment as to approve something absolutely terrible. The Supreme Court's history on amendments is 
very good. They, they generally follow the original meaning of the amendments quite well, especially for a while. Um, and, and so if we got 40 or 50 years of limited government, improve the integrity of this process, we've done something really good for the country. But like you said, our application includes germane, is germane to propose checks and balances on the Supreme Court, and that's essential what we're, we want to do. And having uh, to give 30 states, which, which is the, the idea that I favor, give 30 state legislatures the ability to vacate decisions of the Supreme Court so that the decision would be binding only on Roe and Wade, not on anybody else, if they, if they vacate it. And, and so that it erases the precedent uh, of that decision. If the court's going to make uh, political decisions, there's got to be a political check and balance on that. Secondly, I think the state should appoint the Supreme Court. If we want to have real checks and balances on Washington, D.C., have a rotating Supreme Court. Let's pick a term. Let's, let's for the sake of the math, you can change this easily. But, uh, let's say we have 13 judges on the court, minor change in size, and give them four-year terms and rotate them. If you do that every 16 years, a state would get to pick one judge. You don't want them uh, coming back because then they'll curry favor. Judicial independence is important, so it's one and done. You're on the so it's four years or eight years. It's just math. You can figure it out. And so, but to have the states appoint the Supreme Court would be essential because one of the best things that would be about that is they wouldn't all be from Harvard and Yale. Every member of the Supreme Court right now either went to Harvard or Yale for either undergraduate school or law school. And I think it's time that we get some people that went a few other places on the Supreme Court of the United States. Like Patrick Henry. <laughs> Patrick Henry would be good. Um, and it, I, I understood there to be two, two possible questions which should be kept distinct from each other. One is um, when something produced by an Article 5 convention uh, gets to Supreme Court review for the first time, whatever its subject matter may be, uh, will the Supreme Court knock it down? And uh, although there is some record to draw on of deference on, under the political question doctrine, um, my own prediction is that the uh, there would be a big opportunity for a hostile Supreme Court to wipe out the work of convention by finding some way in which it did not conform with the procedures that it reads into the process. The second question, very distinct, is should the content of constitutional uh, amendments uh, alter the role of the Supreme Court? And uh, many of the proposals do. The, uh, Governor Abbott's proposal in Texas, for example, uh, includes uh, state legislative review of Supreme Court decisions. Uh, and alarm bells went up with many libertarians about that because it means that decisions under the Bill of Rights, decisions granting free speech or uh, firearms rights that happen to be unpopular among the states. And if there's anything that we know, it's that you know, popularity changes and sometimes the conservatives are uh, you know, better uh, p positioned in one branch of government and then a generation later they will be better positioned in a different uh, one. But uh, Supreme Court protection of individual rights could be substantially compromised. Um, I do think that if you're talking about the power of the state governments, you need to go back and revisit the amendment which stripped state legislatures of the right to appoint senators because that was not only a very, very practical, uh, important uh, watershed in uh, depriving the states of their once uh, um, uh, independent you know, the, uh, role, in, in their coordinate role in, in governance, but um, if that, that one cannot be overturned, and I believe that overturning that one is one of Mark, Mark Levin's proposals, but if you can't even uh, get rid of that one, you are probably not going to restore um, more uh, unusual and, and novel uh, state roles such as state selection of the Supreme Court. That one the founders actually did put in there. We've, we've been in an experiment for a century since the progressive age. I think the results of the experiment have not been terribly good and uh, encourage a debate about whether or not uh, uh, the states should get that formal power, but let's go back and look at the way the founders wanted to give them that formal power. Um, I would also add, and I put this in my article that, that you'll find at the Cato website, that, you know, Scalia used to say that if a part of the Constitution has died in the hearts of the people, the courts cannot keep it alive. And he had his own examples about that. Uh, but federalism uh, in general, and uh, unfortunately some of the other things that we've been talking about, will only be revived if they are revived in the hearts of the people. Now, um, in the case of the states, it's paradoxical that the state legislatures are willing to uh, call for a convention and thus 
in principle, say that uh, things have gone very wrong and, and uh, uh, need a drastic change, and yet they are unwilling to do some of the uh, simpler things, um, like turn down involvement in federal programs. And uh, my favorite book on federalism recently by Michael Grieva um, called The Upside Down Constitution traces uh, what I think it's not too strong to call the corruption of state governments in which uh, so-called cooperative federalism has pulled them into a web of relations with the federal government that would make it impossible to get most of those amendments ratified because the state governments have bought into a large federal government in ways that would take a skilled surgeon weeks to, uh, to, to undo. I, I would not support not having elections anymore. And um, just to make clear uh, where the um, where my emphasis was, well, let, 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 you, you've raised a couple of big, big points. So uh, first, uh, I thought the center of gravity of my warning was that the procedures are so ill-defined that you're not going to be able to um, make the process stick without um, very dangerous disagreements as to whether or not the appropriate process has been made. Uh, the runaway thing, it, it, for the same reason that we were agreeing, ratification is extremely hard. Um, we need to remember that there are some popular ideas that we disagree with, uh, but have, you know, let's say that they got in an overturn of Citizens United. I would be upset because I like Citizens United. That wouldn't be the end of the world because it, it's basically the same result we're going to get once they confirm Justice Merrick Garland. You know, they, we're, there are multiple roads to the, um, uh, well, it's, yeah, it's bad, but let's face it, they, you know, they can push us off the one cliff or they can push us off the other cliff, and either way we lose uh, some very important uh, for First Amendment rights. <clears throat> I do not believe in giving up on the American system or giving up on democracy, uh, or better yet, a republic, which is what they gave us, uh, because uh, the public's heart has been turned away from some of the original principles. Uh, I believe that uh, the public heart must be one to the principles, and at that point, uh, there are multiple options. At that point, you might get a president who is more serious about uh, constitutional uh, principles. You might get uh, more spine or backbone in the U.S. Senate about constitutional issues than you get nowadays. If you can bring back that affection for the original principles of the founding in the hearts of the people, lots of good things happen. Uh, and it, you might, in fact, get a better ability to nominate and confirm uh, constitutional as Supreme Court justices. So you, th this has in fact been one of the themes in the past about the Article 5 process. You know, it's nearly worked a couple of times. Okay. And, well, or, or maybe that we're all sunk and that none of these methods, including the one being recommended tonight, will, will work. Uh, it may be that moving to New Zealand is the, um, the best advice. <laughs> but let me, tell, let me tell my anecdote about how uh, if you're making progress in one area, you often begin in another because Congress, in fact, uh, was stampeded into a couple of actual constitutional amendments because the Article 5 um, call process was getting close enough. And that, to me, confirms my general intuition that if uh, the, the movement we're talking about is strong enough to get it by the one way, they are also strong enough to send Congress into a panic and get some relief otherwise. We have time for one more question. Can I respond to that? Oh. Uh, Okay, real, real quickly. Um, Mr. Olson has asked us to give up on the process that's actually in the Constitution. Yes. Article 5 is there. The founders gave it to us. They told us to use it. When the federal government abuses its authority, this is when you're supposed to use it. And so if we're not going to use it now, when are we ever going to use it? So we're abandoning the very solution the founders gave us. Um, if we, th if the, the pie in the sky you just heard of Washington, D.C., I believe that when I went there in the early years of the Reagan administration. Ronald Reagan, greatest president of my lifetime, couldn't get the Department of Education to be dismissed, repealed. We, Washington, D.C. will never relinquish power. The, the, the pie in the sky thing you heard there is, is asking to repeal human nature. It will not happen. This is the only methodology. We've got to play where we're strong. We're not strong in Washington, D.C. The people who believe in the Constitution are strong in the states. This is where we can win. This is where we can have victory.
First of all, that case, the usury case, got re uh, reversed a couple of years later by the San Antonio decision. Uh, Six years later by the yeah. yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Right. And so um, the uh, Supreme Court faithfulness to the Tenth Amendment is not a good record. Um, to be uh, about half of every state's budget is dictated by Congress, about half. So the idea that, that we can do this battle primarily on the state level neglects the fact that we have violated the fundamental principle of a Republican form of government. The voters in California and Illinois and New York and so on are telling Congress to tell the legislature of Missouri how they should vote. The legislators of Missouri have a very constrained set of choices. And so if we're going to restore a, a Republican form of government where the people in, in, in the Jefferson City are responsible to the voters of Missouri, you've got to get rid of that 50% of the budget coming with strings from Washington, D.C., commanding them to obey the voters in California, Illinois, Florida, and Texas. We are violating the principle of a Republican form of government every day. And if we're going to recover state power, we've got to use the Constitution the solution that we've, we've been given. Yeah, last word. Um, the history at the Supreme Court that you raise in which they um, made some serious moves to try to uh, respect state autonomy, to bring back some of the ideas that clearly were in the, the uh, framework of, of the founders, and then, um, as in the later history of the Usury Doctrine, uh, just gave up and backed down. It, it's deeply discouraging. Um, and you could treat it as a, a passage of legal intellectual history in which they just didn't get enough support um, uh, for a, a new concepts of federalism, but you also can point to the state governments themselves who, I, I think you hinted at this, the state governments, when it came down to actually showing up in Washington and making the arguments, they were not standing up for their autonomy. The state governments had bought into uh, the modern New Deal and, and past system to the point where, yeah, it was easy to let the legislature pass resolutions. That's not actually going to affect the various spending interests that are often in control of some of the state governments. But when it came to doctrines that would disentangle them, uh, you know, things like abolishing the Federal Department of Education, which I dearly wish President Reagan could have done, but a lot of those same conservative state governments that talked a good game back to their own constituents were not sending the right signals about whether they want the federal government out of it. So uh, it is the hearts of the people again. And I do not give up either on winning back the hearts of the people or for that matter on the Article 5 process. I've talked about how um, the Rappaport plan for clarifying the process uh, would be a firm stepping stone that would get us part of the way. And I also would say, uh, and I know we've got to close, but I would say that these are prudential and temporary uh, arguments against having an Article 5 convention. If uh, America had uh, the founders around us, uh, a lot would be different. Instead, we have Nancy Pelosi and uh, Harry Reid. And the, uh, this, I believe, is what, sorry to keep arguing about uh, Justice Scalia, but I believe what he was getting at is that um, the types of risks that you can take when you have people like the founders around, uh, it stops being prudent to take when you have a political culture uh, that just doesn't understand what they did. Gentlemen, thank you very much.